Hi, I am uh, Herbert van der Sompel and I want to talk to you about open platforms for web-based research communication. And there are uh, three things I would like to do uh, in this presentation. First of all, talk about why open in the sense of technical interoperable platforms for research communication are necessary. Then I want to talk a bit about very basic so-called follow your nose interoperability for the web. And then I'll uh, end with showing you some examples of neat things that can be achieved by just using a very basic uh, interoperability. When in doubt, always go back to the functions of scholarly communication as defined by Rosendahl and Goertz. First of all, uh, the registration function that allows claims of precedence for a scholarly finding. Certification that establishes the validity of a claim, which was in the journal system implemented by means of peer review. Awareness, which is about allowing actors in the system to remain aware of new claims. Archiving, which of course aims at preserving the scholarly record over time. And then there's the derived function of rewarding that basically rewards the actors in the system of scholarly communication for their performance. And that's based on metrics that can be derived from the system. So Rosendahl and Geert say that uh, whatever the implementation of a scholarly uh, communication system is, it needs to fulfill uh, these functions. So when you look at the paper journal system, you observe that most of these functions were fulfilled in a vertically uh, integrated way. One would register a manuscript with a journal. The journal would take care of peer reviewing it, which was the certification function. Then the journal would find its way into libraries where people would consult it, and they would also be archived uh, in the libraries. The rewarding function was uh, based on the impact factor, which was derived from counting uh, citations in journals. Then came the web, and with the web, the insight that one could just put information out there. So one could just register scientific findings without actually uh, certifying them. And that could even be done at the global level with a system of many preprint uh, repositories. And so people would have to become aware of information that was being put into those systems. Now one has a little discoverability problem, obviously, if people would have to go search in thousands of preprint repositories. And that's where the protocol for metadata harvesting uh, came in, basically as an interoperable interface to allow information to flow from the registration function. So information that was put into preprint repositories into an awareness function, meaning portals that would allow one to search across many of these repositories. The preprint rebels actually also cared about uh, archiving as exemplified, for example, uh, by the global mirroring of uh, archive uh, content, the physics uh, archive that is, that is not done in a way that is interoperable across many systems involved in registration and archiving, but rather in an archive uh, specific manner. But still, it's a neat example of how early on uh, with the preprint uh, movement, people already understood that materials that get registered also need to be archived. Then came the insight that, well, once you've registered things, you actually can also certify them, but not necessarily in an integrated way, but rather in an overlay kind of matter, in a standoffish uh, kind of way. So one could almost think here of certification of um, uh, peer-reviewed materials by means of annotations. If you think about such a system, well, obviously the registration and certification functions somehow need uh, to be interoperable. Information needs to be flow uh, across these two. But in addition to that, information about both these functions also need to flow into the awareness uh, function. Obviously, people need to be aware that new materials are being registered in these repositories. 
And then they also need to be aware of whether and how those materials were certified by other means, so not in a vertically integrated uh, manner. And obviously all of that information then also needs to flow into the archiving function. Then came the metric converters. And with the metric converters, it was all about the understanding that once scholarly communication happens in a global network environment, there's so much more information that we can extract from this uh, environment that could be used to create a whole range of new metrics. And in the measure project that I did with uh, Johan Bollen, we basically looked at download information of papers and try to figure out whether meaningful metrics uh, about the performance of the authors, about the performance of the journals and the articles could be derived from that. And the finding was yes, indeed, uh, meaningful me uh, metrics could be derived from download information. So information could flow from the awareness function, which is reading uh, about reading and downloading papers into the rewarding function. This work inspired the old metrics and the uh, um, article uh, le uh, level metric movement. And you see a whole range of uh, activities uh, in that realm that I'm sure you're all very uh, well aware of. You see also a lot of activity in making this happen in some kind of an interoperable way, meaning information needs to flow from systems that are involved in scholarly communication into the rewarding function, meaning into a whole range of metrics derived from the performance of the authors and of their assets in the scholarly communication system uh, that is on the web. Bottom line of this entire expose is that I've shown you that once you bring scholarly communication to the web, each of the functions of scholarly communication can be implemented in discrete ways, which is an interesting aspect. But with that comes the challenge that information needs to actually flow between all of these functions. If we don't do that, if we don't have such a flow of information between all the functions of scholarly communication that are implemented in distributed ways across the web, then we do not have a system of scholarly communication. We just have a bunch of platforms that are sitting out there. Now, this is actually a rather um, important uh, problem and a significant one uh, for that matter, because what I've shown you so far are just abstract little boxes that depict the functions uh, of scholarly communication. But the reality is, of course, that in the implementation of each of these functions, several platforms uh, are involved. And so that in order to have information flow across each of these functions, what really happens is that information needs to flow across the platforms that implement each of these functions. Now, you, one can try and achieve that by means of platform to platform interoperability, basically going one by one and say, oh, this is how system A and system B are going to interoperate. And this is how system C and D are going to interoperate and so on and so on. Well, obviously, that is not going to be a scalable proposition because there are way too many systems involved in all of this. And so the way to tackle that problem is not by looking at platform to platform interoperability, but rather by making all of these platforms interoperable with the web as a platform with the web architecture. And so this is what's depicted here. You have that little box down there that is the web. And rather than these platforms all communicating directly with each other, with their own APIs and what have you, we're going to talk about having all of these platforms interoperate via the web and then back upwards. In order to illustrate how that can be done, I'm going to talk about some very basic interoperability notions uh, for the web. And they kind of put under the umbrella of uh, follow your nose. It's going to get a tiny bit technical before we then uh, come uh, more uh, to concrete uh, examples. 
So the, the interoperability currency for the web is obviously the HTTP URI of which you see one uh, written down there. And then there's all kinds of things that we can do uh, with that URI. In terms of the HTTP protocol, the most basic thing that we do on a daily basis when we use a browser is actually issue an HTTP GET against that URI. And when we do that, we get the page back. I mean, we get the resource uh, back that is identified by that URI. That we all know, I think. <clears throat> There's another uh, interaction that we can have with such URI, which is called an HTTP head, actually. And a head is what machines will frequently do to kind of poke at a resource with a certain URI and see what might be uh, coming uh, their way. And you see the result of such an HTTP head here. So it says, yeah, HTTP protocol version 1.1, the kind of server that responds, and then a whole lot of metadata both about the interaction and about the resource at the end uh, of this URI. So that's a HTTP head. Again, machines use it quite often to uh, traverse the web. And there's one element, one piece of metadata uh, that is of special interest uh, for Folio your nose interoperability. And that's this uh, link header that you see here. And basically, this link header provides links that are aimed at machine consumption, just like links in HTML pages are provided for uh, human interaction. And so what you see here is a link that basically says that the author of the URI that we, of the page with the URI that we saw earlier is, you see here, relationship author, is someone that has this as it's your right, and that actually uh, would be me. So this is a rather uh, important mechanism. When a machine finds this kind of link, it can obviously follow it and go see what kind of information is available about uh, that author. Okay, that's all we need to know, and that's all we need to construct a nice uh, kind of functionality just based on these very basic interoperability mechanisms uh, that are you know put under the umbrella of follow your nose. I'm going to give you uh, two scenarios. <clears throat> the first is citation notification. Basically the scenario is there's a paper and P here by the way stands for an HTTP URI just like D here stands for an HTTP URI. So there's a paper here that mentions a, a data set, but the data set is uh, not aware of that. Now, anyhow, here, uh, the system, the platform that operates this paper would like to do a nice thing and inform the authors of the data set that their data set has been mentioned uh, in the paper. So here's what we're doing. There's a bot at the end of this platform here that does a HTTP head against the URI of the data set. <clears throat> and what comes back now in a machine actionable manner in the HTTP headers, in this link uh, header, is information that the author of the data set has a URI, ORCID1, this is obviously an HTTP URI in the ORCID system, and there's another author that has HTTP URI uh, ORCID2. With that information, our bot can know now basically go talk to the ORCID uh, API and poke it to obtain information about these authors. So I'm using the ORCID1 HTTP URI and I'm getting information and there's an XML document that comes back in the case of the ORCID API and in there I can find information about the Twitter handle of uh, the author. And I do that for both authors, so author1 and author2. And now the bot is basically in possession of the Twitter handles of both these authors. And now is in business to, you know, publish a little tweet that basically says P mentions D, so the paper mentions the data set, and I'm obviously going to be nice, that was the whole goal here, and I'm going to copy author one and author two by means of their Twitter handle. And, you know, in real time, they are being made aware that there's a new paper that used their data set. Again, the only thing I really used here was a HTTP head, a link header, and then I poked at an uh, published API. Second example, a much discussed example, as a matter of fact, connecting paper and data. So again, it's the same scenario in essence. The paper mentions uh, the data set, 
but the data set is not aware that uh, the paper mentioned it and we want to change that situation. So we're going to do a very similar thing. There's a bot at the end of the platform of the paper that is going to do a HTTP head against the data set. And the data set comes back in this case with a relation type uh, that says web mention and a URI of where that web mention thing uh, is available. Now web mention is a new approach for a trackback or pingback and it basically allows uh, parties uh, on the web to let another party know that their resource uh, references uh, uh, this one here uh, to the right hand side. So what we know, what the bot here now knows is that there is at the end of the dataset platform a URI that supports the web mention protocol to which uh, information can be submitted about other resources on the web that use resource D, so the dataset. That's what I'm going to do. So in this case, there's another uh, HTTP interaction that we're going to use because we are going to push information into uh, this URI. And this is HTTP POST, it's called. You use it on a daily basis when you fill out forms. But in this case, it's our uh, robot that is going to do it. And the Web Mention Protocol says that the way in which to do this is to say the source is P and the target is D. So that basically means that P mentions uh, D. With that information now being available to the platform of the data set, we can update uh, this information here. And suddenly both those platforms are aware of the fact that they are used. Uh, so the paper uses the data set, the data set is mentioned in the paper. Again, I've done this by way of very basic follow your nose uh, web interoperability. Well, that concludes my presentation. I hope that I've shown you that open in the sense of interoperability uh, is essential for platforms that are involved in web-based scholarly communication. I've shown you what some of the primitives uh, are that we can use for web interoperability and then I've shown you two scenarios that actually fit in all of this. Well, thank you very much and I'm sorry that I am not there in person.